Okay, great. And welcome to another episode of The Focal Thought. My guest today is Catherine DeLong. How are you, Catherine? I'm great. Thank you. Awesome. And thank you again for that beautiful rendition that you started the episode with. Um, just in terms of an introduction, uh, Catherine, you currently serve individuals nearing the end of life as a music thanatologist, and you are a chaplain for Aspire Home Health and Hospice Patients in Salt Lake City. So I'm really excited to have you on the episode today. You know, thanatology is, is one of those subjects that a lot of people are not too familiar with. It really has to do with, you know, the scientific study of death and, you know, also from a, a forensic aspect, what happens to the cadaver, you know, after death, it has to do with grief and also in some cases, the social and cultural aspects of death, how we view it, how we treat it, you know, how we deal with it. But you specialize as a music anatologist, which is very interesting. So I was wondering if you could start by just talking a bit about that subject and what it is you do. Thank you. I'm so glad to be with you today. Um, a thanatologist or a music thanatologist uses music and specifically the harp and voice to be at the bedside of people who are nearing the end of life. Um, just to clarify the terminology, Thanatos in Greek mythology was the god of death and his twin brother was Hypnos. Um, but Thanatos, um, we get the word Thanatology from Thanatos, and as you've said, that the, the word Thanatology by itself means the study of death and dying. And so my training is specific to a population that is nearing the end of their life. Um, I play for individuals, but the music is particularly effective for their loved ones. Um, for anyone who is in the room. And I worked for some time at Bellevue Hospital, at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. And time and again, I would finish a session with a patient and I would find um, a doctor or a nurse standing outside the room listening. And they expressed in so many words that that just hearing a few notes changed um, their, the way they were feeling. And so the, um, the experience of having music on a palliative unit in, in a bedroom is so intimate uh, where patients are vulnerable and where their families are vulnerable. So um, it's really a privilege to get to bring music to people who are declining. Um, one of the things that is essential to serving people at the end of life is uh, synchronizing the music with their respiration. So when I enter a room, I watch a person's breathing, I, I might count the number of breaths, and then I synchronize my music with their respiration. And this um, offers them a real subtle sense of companioning. It helps them know that they're seen and uh, bringing something beautiful to a person, even if they're unresponsive, it honors them. Uh, a person who is ill oftentimes uh, has experienced their world getting smaller and smaller and oftentimes it might um, you know the geography of their world might be as small as that of just the bed that they're in and so to bring them something beautiful really honors them and uh, even though they may not be able to speak they can hear the music uh, hearing is the first sense to develop in utero and it is the last sense to leave a person oh really well, yes yeah well, i'm really glad uh, you're doing this because you know as a as a musician myself the traditional you know venue that we play in or the traditional purpose is you know to excite or to provide happiness uh, to provide joy elation um, in a very sort of you know vibrant setting 
you know, we think of weddings or, you know, concerts or, or restaurants, bars, clubs, etc., things like that. Uh, sometimes we might work in a corporate capacity where we're sort of playing background music for people who are networking and, you know, just providing that sort of ambience. Sure. Uh, but this is very specific and you're still sort of having that end purpose of, you know, bringing joy and peace. But it's, it's almost a very sort of uh, a sad setting because someone is dying. Um, and, you know, normally they might not know which, you know, how to take in the emotions and feelings. Like you're saying, you know, their geography is limited to, you know, their bed setting. You know, their mind might be going through chaos. Mm. But what you've come here to do is bring sort of dignity, you know, to the passing of, you know, uh, life on, on this planet and, and on to the next. And not only for them, but you mentioned also, you know, to their loved ones who might be in the same room as well, right? So it's very different from the traditional, you know, music gig that, that a musician would do. Right. And it's very clear that um, my music can, cannot change any outcomes, but it can make a difference in um, how people feel and what they experience in those moments before passing. Uh, music can um, help patients and their loved ones make meaning of the end of their life. Oftentimes it, it will be uh, a catalyst for the release of emotions. You see family trying to be so strong and oftentimes within, I'm going to say about 60 seconds, there they will weep. And um, it's, it's an appropriate time to weep. And those tears are sacred. Oh, for sure. And it's almost as if that, that you know, that moment where, where the death happens, you're very important because you're almost sort of providing a, um, a craft to sort of carry the emotions but also you know when when they're grieving after to sort of you know cushion the, the emotions as well so you're almost like the glue that's sort of binding everything together right with, with the music it does it fills the space yeah. um oftentimes there are machines that are making noises you hear here if if we're on a palliative unit, we might hear sounds in the hall. Um, but it fills the space. This sounds kind of corny, but it fills the space with love. Yeah. And um, where something um, uh, I want to say of a wholeness, rather than just pure sadness can be felt. Uh, there can be a peace actually, when someone passes. And in our culture, we have pushed the dying experience so far away from us. We don't have very much experience with it. Um, and the music softens the experience of those who are new. New. This might be the first time a person has seen death. And it, it really helps them hold that space for themselves and for their loved ones. Um, when my mother was dying, a music thanatology friend came and played the morning she died. And I felt myself just really falling into a dark despair place. And then, and when my friend arrived and the music began, it was like, oh, I can be here and I can do this. And I was far more present on that day and I could experience the beauty of it because there, there can be real beauty in witnessing your loved one's passing. Um, and I know this is not new news, but, but dying is a natural passage. And it's an opportunity for each one of us. Um, we, really, we all are gonna get to do this. And so the music helps us be, I think, a little more mindful about how we approach this threshold. No, definitely. And I like that you said it, it softens the experience, it provides some sort of, you know, wholeness. And, you know, even though it's a natural experience, we don't know how to naturally deal with this. So this really, you know, I said it before, provides that cushion of comfort for, you know, the person that's passing, as well as for the, 
the close people around that are grieving because that grieving is important. You know, you might be in a state of confusion after it's happened. You don't know what to think. There's a lot of crying, but the music provides that sort of background ambience. And, you know, with music, people have said that it, um, you know, the traditional saying music suits the savage beast. And there's a purpose to the type of music you play. So, for example, if you're playing a wedding, you know, you'll traditionally play something upbeat if it's for dancing. You play something, you know, a little bit more lower tempo. If, you know, if the bride's walking in, again, if it's, you know, during the cocktail hour, a little bit of ambience music. Right. So with this situation, you have to choose your your music carefully because like you say you're playing a different sort of tempo you're customizing the rhythm you know to to the breathing you know to the environment to the person right exactly and it is considered prescriptive i'll give you a little example uh if a patient has um received let's say a terminal diagnosis and they are struggling with this which is very understandable um, they might be depressed and, and if I know this going in, I might start playing a piece of music in a minor key with the goal of meeting them where they are and acknowledging their sadness. And then I might slowly move that into something in a major key. And, and this can be really useful in helping them process what is real for them. That's very intelligent because, yeah, if they're feeling sad, you don't want to sort of, you know, just play happy music at the outset, right? That's sort of almost disrespecting how they're feeling. Exactly. And there is a sense of entrainment. When you talk about going to concerts and weddings and things, we might not be aware of it, but our bodies do sync up with that happy, exciting music. And um, we want to with with uh, music thanatology actually support the possibility of moving to a new a new way of being to a new condition and we don't want to synchronize so much um we want to leave the music be let the music be spacious oftentimes we play unfamiliar music if you are um a person who is nearing the end of life and I play your favorite piece for you that will bring up memories and it will um, possibly anchor you to this world when really at a certain point you you are ready to move on and so some music that is unfamiliar that is spacious that is simple may be the most effective in helping you relax, in calming the nervous system, and and literally in allowing you to peacefully let go. Got it. And you know, you are playing the harp, and the harp is a very beautiful instrument. It's a very underrated instrument. You know, it's a very old instrument in the history of the world. It goes as far back as I would say maybe 3000 BC. You know, with exactly. mythology and a lot of folklore, you know, it, it's there in the stories, you know, it's cousin the lair, it's got different sort of members of the family. What would you say is very special about the harp? I mean, just, you know, when you started this episode by playing it, I was almost hypnotized by it. So if you could just maybe talk a bit about that. Yes, it's power as, as a, a mu- an instrument that will provide a soothing effect has been known for centuries. Um, the long strings vibrate and you know our different organs um, have a different resonant vibration and the strings vibrate with our bodies and the nice thing is that the sound gradually fades away it's not invasive which is really beneficial for a person who is sick and who's really fragile. So um, this music is, we think of it as soft, and yet it kind of cuts through um, the ether and it can be heard so beautifully. Um, I love this instrument because it derives from natural elements, from wood. Strings are made of um, animal intestines 
um, there's metal in parts of it, but it's, it's, um, it's been like this forever. And we think it derived from a bow and arrow or the bow aspect of the bow and arrow. Oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, the closest I can think of, you know, sounding to the harp might be the classical guitar. And, you know, just because of its nylon strings and the way You're it's right. plucked. You're right. And um, it, there are really only two instruments. One is the guitar or the ukulele or, you know, anyone in that guitar family. Um, and the harp, where the sound is actually made with the body itself. There's not a bow. There's not a reed. There's The sound is not going through any other vessel the sound is being generated by the human body and i think there's some magic to that sure and then this definitely has a effect on the physiology like you're saying um because if the you know the harp resonates with the body and its organs you know what you play is how the person will feel and you know not only in the the timber but with the the tempo as well uh, with the song selection and, you know, it's really the harp and the music that you're playing that's carrying the person, right, from the passing of, of life to death, literally holding the person's body. Well, I don't want to assume too much, but, <laughs> but <laughs> I think you're on to something. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it really, um, I want to say th um, maybe more so than holding the person's body, it holds the space for whoever is in it. Yeah. Uh, and it does allow for for everyone there to relax a bit. Correct, yeah. And then, you know, I know you're doing this in a, in a setting that is, you know, in a hospice or palliative care, um, you know, in a, in a hospital. Mm. Um, but s someone can probably use this in, in a different setting where, you know, maybe, uh, you know, euthanasia is being administered. Or, you know, maybe to some prisoners who are on death row, you know, in those final moments. Have you seen it in those settings as well? Um, I, th I think it's possible. I have not, I don't know of anyone in those, who, who's been in those particular settings. But the music is useful for anyone, really. Right. Um, I can play the same music that I would play for a person at the end of life say at the end of a yoga class yeah. when people are um, in corpse pose that is the name of it <laughs> and, <Corpse pose. laughs> yeah and it is it really allows the body and the mind to relax and to let go and this mm -hmm. is beneficial for all of us regardless of where we are in our lives Right. And, you know, by that regard, you could use it in even minor settings, right? Like if you're studying for an exam, if you're stressed, or if you've got a, a job interview coming up, or if you've had heartbreak, or, you know, if you're going through any sort of emotional roller coaster, this can really bring some peace and align you to centering yourself as a maybe a form of musical meditation. even. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, when I've heard um, the harp in, you know, Celtic folk music, it's, it's very popular you know, in, in some of those those songs. It's really the harp that becomes the music, right? Rather than the, the composition of, of the music itself, just by the very nature of the, the sound of the instrument. There is something special with the sound of the music. Um, but you can do a lot with the instrument. It doesn't have to be all slow and um, contemplative. Uh, you can play a jig, you can, you can play f all of the repertoire the, the Celtic repertoire. Um, it's funny you mention that because when people ask, well, now what do you play for yourself when you were just playing for your own satisfaction? And oftentimes it is Celtic music that I will go to. Oh, wow. And then um, for yourself, you know, when, when you're dealing with, you know, playing music in these settings, how do you deal with, you know, after you've done your playing and you've gone home because i'm sure it's a little bit emotional for you as well and I, i'm sure that the music helps you you know while you're playing but by doing you know a lot of uh, you know these performances with patients what do you do to sort of you know deal with the, the emotions that you might be inflicted by i meditate regularly 
that's one of the things. Um, when I was working in New York at Mount Sinai, I walked across Central Park as part of my commute to and from the hospital. And it was an important part of my pre preparing to meet patients and then to processing when I was finished. Um, I think walking, moving the body really helps us um, come to grips with, with our experiences. Uh, I hold my time with patients sacred, but I am able to leave it in the room. Um, just as um, any medical professional, I wash my hands before I play for a patient and after I play for a patient. And that is, besides the, the practical part of it, it is, there's also a sacred aspect of beginning and ending my time with the patient. Yes. And I like that you, you mentioned it's, you know, it's likened to a, a medical professional because I would say you're as important as, as the nurse in the room, right? Because you're administering some sort of, you know, medical care through music. Well, thank you for acknowledging that. Um, slowly, I think our culture is figuring out that we need the arts um, in our medical settings that we need to be lifted by what is beautiful. Yeah, and I you know being a, a musician, I find the arts even today is still very underrated in terms of it being taken for granted. You know, you can imagine where would weddings be without music, right? Or yes. even in the corporate world when, you know, people are working or, you know, taking the subway to work or if they're jogging on a break, they're listening to music on headphones. You know, it provides that, that balance to, you know, some of the, involved hectic work that people do right right yeah and um, i wanted to ask so you know you do teach um, an introduction to integrative thanatology if you could just talk you know for a few minutes about the course and you know what aspects someone can learn by taking that course and what it's used for this is a survey course and it exposes students to a wide range of end-of-life topics. Um, it covers six months. I just want to talk a little bit about the format. It's an intensive weekend once a month for six months with leaders in the end-of-life arena. Um, there will be a weekend about grief a weekend talking about the inspired funeral, another weekend um, dedicated to um, home funerals. Um, and it is a beautiful curriculum uh, presented by nurses, by academics, by um, so many inspired teachers. And it's really been an honor to be part of this, um, what do I want to say? Um, there's an awakening. Yeah. And beginning, I'm going to say, in about uh, the 2000s, individuals are willing to risk looking at death and to saying the words even. Um, on the introductory evening of the course, when I teach the um, general thanatology um, principles, we, we talk about all of the different euphemisms that are used in place of the word dying or death. Um, and there is an author, John Abrams, who has collected 899 euphemisms that we use instead of talking about what is real wow. and looking at what is real. And the end of life is something that whether we know it or not, we're preparing for it our whole life. And to ignore it is really um, kind of, we, we cut ourselves short when we don't think deeply about the fact that we will all die. 
everything that is alive, everything that was born, will at one time die. Um, and even the food we eat, regardless of your, your um, dietary preferences, everything you eat was alive once and now it is, is meeting its death as you eat it. So not to be morose, but <laughs> no. um, this, is, this is real. And, um, and it's just a fact. It's just a fact. And so to, to imagine that that's never going to happen to us, um, oftentimes we say, well, I'm okay with dying, but just not now. I want to do it down the road, far, far away. But I think that we need to wisely realize this could come our way at any time. We just don't know. I mean, yes. a pandemic has kind of shown us this. Yes. And you know, like you're saying, it's it's one of those subjects that's not discussed and should be discussed, you know, very maturely, especially parents with children, you know, they'll teach them the, the ways of the world. You know, some parents will even talk about the birds and the bees, you know, when they're of a certain yes. age, but they won't discuss the death of the birds and the bees. And, and it's important because, you know, it does happen. And then if you prepare someone, it can, you know, drastically change their outlook on life, right? Because some people will start counting the grains of sands once, you know, they realize that, you know, our life is limited here. You know, they might even be motivated to, to get to work right away. And then another aspect, when they're faced with that, you know, loss of a, a loved one, they know how to deal with grief rather than become a victim of grief, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. I'm re reminded when you talk about children. Uh, <laughs> my mother-in-law used to feed birds and occasionally one would hit the window and die. And she would save it and put it in the freezer until my kids came over. And she would show them the bird. They would create a little... Um, They'd get a shoebox and make a beautiful little casket for this bird. We would have funerals and sing to it. It was um, a beautiful preparation. And I've always hold the, held those, um, those experiences watching my mother-in-law train my kids about this is death. And in such a soft and beautiful way. That's wonderful because, yeah, there are some cultures that, you know, actually celebrate death. Like if we look at the, the you know, the Mexican culture, they actually mm -hmm. celebrate death with, you know, food and beautiful colors. And it doesn't have to be melancholy, right? It doesn't have to be. Um, I think that we need to hold every feeling, every emotion as sacred and there will be sadness and yet um, these things change at times and i think the one of the things i've learned about grief is that whatever grief you're experiencing in the time whatever form that is taking that is yours and to and it is to be honored and there is not a timeline for grief there are not you don't have to go through the steps it's whatever you're feeling is is acceptable not even acceptable it's yours and hold it and and i wanted to say um that way you get through grief but oftentimes um it comes and goes and for our whole life we have we're fine and then we'll have moments of, of deep grief over the loss of someone regardless of when it was we lost them yeah you know we're only human and you know that's it's okay to, to have that roller coaster it's it's not that you know as you're saying grief should pass and that's it we're never going to grieve again we should be open to accepting it and when it comes back every time it comes back we'll be in a, a better state to, to deal with it and we'll things will get better from being able to deal with grief yes not trying to push it away yeah. is the most healthy thing that we can do and not let you know grief turn into trauma because that that's when it it can get you know ineffective to, to living a purposeful life and life of quality and happiness. And there are times when 
when professional help should be sought. Uh, if you really are in a dark place, um, that's what professionals are there for. Um, they can help us, but, but gr grief is real and it is a real part of life. And um, we all get to experience it in some way or another in our life. It's just part of the human experience. Yeah, it's coupled with happiness, you know, the, they both go together, right? The yin and the yang. Yes. It makes life. <laughs> for sure. Oh, that's awesome. Once again, uh, Catherine, thank you again for coming on this episode. Uh, thank you for that, you know, beautiful piece of music you played in the beginning. And again, also, thank you for the work that you do, because, you know, this is something that's not been very popular in, you know, contemporary sort of, you know, uh, society. You know, it, it has been there, like we've seen with the Egyptians, you know, how they, they embalmed, you know, and mummified, you know, bodies and things like that. But, you know, in this day and age, the, the work that you do to bring, you know, sort of strength, buoyancy, and, you know, just sort of brightening up the, you know, the topic of death when it matters most, you know, in that room, mm -hmm. that's really beautiful. So I really thank you for that. And thanks again for coming on the show. Well, thank you for shining a light on this work. I am so grateful to have the opportunity to speak with you about it. No, that's great. And I wish you well. Thanks. You too. Bye-bye.